persecuted and brought freedom. Jesus was dead and brought life. Jesus Christ is risen and brings power. Hallelujah. Jesus reigns and brings peace. Hallelujah. Jesus is light, love, longevity, and Lord. Jesus is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. Jesus is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His rays are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging, and his mind is on us. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. Jesus yeah. is my Savior. Yeah. Jesus is my guide. Yeah. Jesus is my peace. You, Jesus Lord. is my joy. Jesus is my comfort. Jesus is my Lord, and Jesus rules my life. Hallelujah. Woo! We serve Jesus Christ because his bond is love, his burden is light, and his intent for us is abundant life. Thank you, Lord. We follow Jesus because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the overseer of the overcomers, and the sovereign Lord of all that was and is and is to come. Our Lord's desire is for a relationship with us. Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. Never mislead us and never forget us. Never overlook us and never cancel my appointment in his appointment book. Thank you, Lord. When we fall, Jesus lifts us up. When we fail, Jesus forgives. When we are weak, Jesus is strong. When we are lost, Jesus is the way. When we are afraid, Jesus is our courage. When we stumble, Jesus steadies us. When we are hurt, Jesus heals us. When we are broken, Jesus mends us. Thank you, Lord. When we are blind, Jesus leads us. When we are hungry, Jesus feeds us. Yes, Lord. When we face trials, Jesus is with us. When we face persecution, Jesus shields us. When we face problems, Jesus comforts us. When we face loss, Jesus provides for us. And when we face death, Jesus will carry us home. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, and every way. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is faithful. I am his and he is mine. Our Father in heaven has triumphed over the Father of this world. And so, if you're wondering why I feel so secure, understand this. He said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God is in control. I am on his side, and that means all is well with my soul. Every single day of my life is a blessing because Jesus Christ is alive and coming back. Jesus Christ is. Holy Spirit, Holy God, I just pray, Lord, that you're uh, in Jesus. You are here, Lord, uh, as we celebrate uh, you, Lord. And, uh, and I thank you, Lord, that you're in our midst. And, uh, and bless the worship and bless the reading of the word today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How you doing this morning? Hey, everybody all right? Hey, everybody good? Man, this is, this is a special time right here. This is a special time. Man, this is like back in the day, man, before you got saved. You, was, you had your cold brew and was getting ready to watch the game. That's what this is. This is, this is better, though. <laughs> this is, this is life-giving power in communion, man. It is, it is, I can feel him changing me. And I thank God. For every time I partake of this sacrificial giving to us. Those of you at home, praise God. I'm Pastor Bird. You know, we just here and we just want to come together. And um, let me share some scripture with you first, and then we'll go and we'll uh we'll partake. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I got a couple set of scriptures. We're going to go to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians first. Amen. Amen. I pray that everybody's doing well and uh, just hang in there. God's, God's got something. He always has something up his sleeve. Um, he always has something for you. It's tough. Seasons come and seasons go. Some are tough. Some are better than others, but the thing about it is you have to know by faith 
that God is going to pull you out of whatever it is. Amen. You got to know that he's bigger than the situation or circumstance. Sometimes it's to teach us something. Sometimes it has nothing to do with teaching us anything. Sometimes we just go through just to go through. Amen. But the point of the matter is, is we know that he's with us. He's, he's made the sacrifice. Amen. Okay, let's go. Let's let's go to scripture. Let's go to verse. Let's 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 go and let's start in twenty three. First Corinthians eleven twenty three, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And you see, he, he left a signification for us to do, for us to remember. And just being able to have that it is, is a blessing, amen? Did I bring my cup? Please, somebody get me. Get, get my cup off of there or get me one, please. He, and after the same manner, he took the cup and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, thank you so much, is, is the New Testament of my blood. This, this is a whole New Testament. When we begin to partake here, we're, we're taking on a new likeness, a new challenge, a new form. Amen? Let me, let me read this other scripture, then we'll take it. Let's, and then let's go over to, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's go over to Hebrews 9.12. Verse 12, 9, 12 through 15. Neither by the blood of calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. Amen. <laughs> eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth and purifieth the flesh how much more shall the blood of Jesus who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God Let's partake of his body. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise you, God. Cleanse me, I am a sinner. Cleanse me, Lord. Father, as we partake, we just ask you cleanse us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father God, thank you so much for your wisdom, your knowledge, your body, your blood. We even thank you for, for, for everything that you put together. And we just ask and pray that as Jesus was obedient and he gave his body, let us be obedient to you for those things that you have for us to do, Lord God. We thank you and praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. When our uh, church was planted some years ago, we began with five words from Scripture that we believed the Lord was speaking to us 
concerning the purpose, the destiny, the future of the church. And, um, you know, when, when we had our first services, we spent weeks uh, on each one of those passages, each one of those verses, uh, sharing them. In the past uh, three weeks, since we've been back um, live, first week you just, we just really felt the, the Lord's presence for physical healing. The second week we felt God's presence to remove any inner obstacles to discipleship. And then last week when we gathered together we just felt the Lord saying that the corporate purpose, the corporate destiny for which this church was raised up would be fulfilled. Which led me, of course, to the passage in the book of Revelation. We're going to go to the the church in Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3. That was one of our five startup verses, uh, five verses that have guided us through the entire history of the church. The Lord's added a few scriptures to those five. But if we're going to become what the Lord has desired us to become, then the church in Philadelphia, the message to the church in Philadelphia is very appropriate. I'm going to read those verses first. That's a Revelation 3, 7 through 12, and then we'll, we'll comment on a few of them. Revelation 3, 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have but a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, even to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world, the whole, the entire inhabitable earth, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we, as we look at this word and we're reminded of divine promises, as we look back over our history and as we look forward into the future, Father. We thank you that you've given us this word, O oh God. By the power of your spirit, by the power of your grace, by the power of your gospel, by the power that is inherent in the redemptive purposes of your Son. Have your way in our midst, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Now I'm probably going to highlight, I'm going to attempt to highlight three aspects uh, from uh, the letter, from the message. Uh, I'm going to interact with a, a, a book. I, you know, I've, I've taught Revelation 3, the church in Philadelphia, so many times. Um, I mean, you know, it's one of those things, just looking at the passage, you could, you could teach it in your sleep. But I always like to look at different commentaries and things, perhaps there'll be a, um, an insight uh, that, that we've missed as we've looked over this. And the book, one of the books that I picked up this weekend, it's written by Jan Fekas, and the title of the book is Isaiah, 
and prophetic traditions in the book of Revelation. And three passages here uh, to the church in Philadelphia really draw on Isaiah. And since we've been studying Isaiah um, and reading Isaiah as a church, uh, I thought those would be appropriate. The most obvious is the message to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, this is what is to be written. The vision of Christ that is presented at the start of this and each one of the messages to the seven churches has a, a picture of Jesus uh, that is being emphasized that church. It's a vision of Jesus. Remember the book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus. We see that in chapter one. And then each of the seven churches gets a message from the Lord with a different aspect of Jesus from Revelation one to be unveiled in the midst of that church. And as that church perceives that particular dimension of Jesus, that church enters into its prophetic destiny. So again, just the, the messages to the churches are connected to the, the, the vision of Jesus, the unveiling of Jesus in Revelation 1, and of course the, the ultimate unveiling of Christ to the, the whole world that is the topic of the, the prophecy of the book of Revelation. So the, the vision of Christ is this. These things says the Holy One, the True One, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shall shut, and the one who shuts and no one shall open. Now, what's interesting about that is Jesus being called the Holy One, or Jesus being called the True One. Neither one of those are seen in Revelation chapter 1, but the key the key of David that is referenced is, has a relationship to the fact that Jesus says this when John sees him unveiled in Revelation 1. In Revelation 1, verse 17, John says, when I saw him, when I see, saw Jesus appear, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of the grave. And I have the keys of death. So Jesus is seen holding keys to death and the grave. And that key is specifically referred to in the message to the church in Philadelphia as the key of David. Now that in itself takes us back to the book of Isaiah. That's a specific reference to a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 22. Now, Isaiah 22 is broken into two prophetic words. Uh, 22 one says, the oracle or the word or the burden concerning the valley of vision. And that is addressed uh, to the nation, to the nation of Judah. It's, it's addressed to God's people. And then uh, the second, the second, and that one runs, like I said, from 22.1 all the way through 22.14. And then there is a second, there's a second prophetic word, and now that's directed to two individuals, Shebna and Eliakim, and that starts in verse 15. And that is where the reference to the key of David occurs. And so this, this prophetic word to Philadelphia relates to certain things taking place in Isaiah chapter 22. Now this is an interesting chapter because the interpretation of the first 14 verses. Uh, when, when you look at the commentators, it's divided between something taking place historically in the life of Shebna and Eliakim, something that would have taken place in the historical life of Isaiah, 
but other commentators say it doesn't fit for those events, but it's really a future prophecy concerning Babylon, when Babylon, of course, would, would take the city of Jerusalem and remove the people of God into exile. Now, the difference in terms uh, between when those would happen, the one is referring to an event uh, in the early 700 BC when Assyria comes to, the, the, to Jerusalem and says, we're going to basically destroy the city. The events of the prophecy of Babylon would be over a hundred years in the future. The reason for me that the, the interpretation that this has to do with Assyria uh, makes more sense is that both Shebna and Eliakim are mentioned. The, the two that are mentioned in verses 15 through 25, those two are mentioned right at in the event when the representative from Assyria comes to the gates of Jerusalem and says, my king, the Assyrian king is coming and he's gonna take this city and nothing you can do can save you from it. Well, two of the individuals that went out to meet him would have been Shebna and Eliakim, so it makes more sense. It doesn't matter which interpretation you take, whether it's a prophecy about Assyria or a prophecy way into the future about Babylon, the issue is still the same. God's people in the midst of great national peril, great national danger, opt for political solutions that cause them not to trust in the Lord. In other words, they would rather trust in their politics than trust in the Lord. And it's just amazing. I mean, brethren, you know, I'm not making these things up. I mean, Scripture is replete. Scripture over and over again has this issue, politics versus the Lord. It is particularly relevant to our time right now, but it's there dripping from the pages of the Old Testament. And it's interesting that the prophecy, they're being rebuked because they won't trust in the Lord. And the prophecy ends like this in verse 14. Verse 14 says, The Lord of hosts has revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity will not be atoned for you until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. It's, very, it's, it's serious to trust in chariots, to trust in horses, instead of trusting in the name of the Lord. But notice twice in verse 14, the Lord of hosts, the Lord God of hosts. That's Yahweh of armies in the Hebrew. And the Lord is saying, what army do you need in the midst of political threats, in the midst of political instability that's greater than my heavenly army. Now, it's in that context that this prophecy about Shebna and Eliakim emerges. And it's actually verses 15 through 25 that we want to look at and tie that in with the message to the church in Philadelphia. The message in the church in Philadelphia says these things says he who is holy, this is Jesus, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. And that verse is taken directly from this second portion of the prophecy in Isaiah 22. And Isaiah 22, 15 starts the same way 14 ended. It's still the same issue. This is Yahweh of armies. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to this steward, to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him. Shebna is the number two man in the Davidic kingdom. He's just under the king. We would call him the steward of the house, 
And by the house, we mean he has both political and religious authority because the house would be the nation of Judah, but the house is also the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord. He exercises authority as the steward of the house. We might call him the prime minister or the major domo in, in terms of modern politics. And so the Lord, now he has rebuked Judah and now he speaks a word to Shebna. Come, go to this steward, to Shebna, who is over the household and say to him, what have you to do here? And whom have you here? In other words, who are you and what the heck are you doing? Remember the context. Israel, the northern tribes, are about to be destroyed by Assyria. Judah is being threatened by Assyria. If you're the prime minister of the nation, you exercise the king's authority in the king's stead, both in the political and the religious realms. If you're doing this in this time of great disaster, what should be your primary focus? God's people, the nation. And yet this individual, Shebna, this man is so consumed with personal self-aggrandizement that this is what the prophet says. Basically, verse 16, what are you doing and, and who the heck do you think you are? That you have cut out here a tomb for yourself. You who cut out a tomb on the height and carve a dwelling place for yourself in the rock. We need to understand the historical background. All the kings of Judah were buried in Jerusalem. They were buried within the city walls. In, during the reign of Hezekiah, and that's when this is taking place, during the reign of Hezekiah, as Assyria was assaulting both the 10 northern tribes, Israel and Judah, Hezekiah had begun what we would call a, a, um, a community refurbishment program. He had begun to expand a lot of things that were going on in the city from water supply to uh, buildings. He, it was a civic project whereby he was renovating Jerusalem. And one of the things he did was he was building a new place for the kings of Israel to be buried. And it was being hewn out of the mountains. This is where the, 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 where the kings would be buried. Their graves would be hewn out of these, these mountains and their, their graves would go in there and that's where they would say and, and so and so, uh, so on and so forth died and, and he was buried with his fathers. Here's someone who's not the king. He's a prime minister, he has great, great authority to act on behalf of the king, but he's not a king, and he's planning and building a grave place for himself with the kings. It's, it's this sense of pride, this sense of it's all about me, this sense of self-aggrandizement, this, this sense of look at me, I'm somebody, that is being rebuked in the midst of a time where that, sh that should be, this, this, your, your personal glory should be the last thing on your mind when your nation is being threatened. And this is what the Lord says. He says, this is what I am going to do. Verse 17 says, behold, the Lord will hurl you away violently O oh, you strong man, he will seize firm hold on you and whirl you around and around and throw you like a ball into a wide land. There you shall die and there shall be your glorious chariots which you shame, which you bring shame, by which you bring shame to your master's house. You are supposed to be the servant of the Lord. You are supposed to be the servant of the people. 
not seeking to aggrandize yourself. And what you end up doing is you're bringing shame to your master's house, the king, King Hezekiah. I will thrust you from your office and you will be pulled down from your station. In that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and I will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And so the pictures, and it's inter interesting, when Shebna is addressed in verse 15, he's not spoken of that he's the son of any father. There's, there's nothing about fatherhood in him. When you are driven by your own personal needs and your own personal glory, there is nothing of the spirit of fatherhood at work in your life. But Eliakim is not only called my servant in verse 20, and now we, we know the implications of that for the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, actually in chapter 20, he himself is called my servant Isaiah. Eliakim is called my servant. And of course, we know Israel will be called the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55, 40 through 66. And then the servant of the Lord will emerge in the four servant songs, which we've been discussing quite a bit. And Eliakim is mentioned as the son of Hilkiah. He was a son, and now he can be a father. The implication is Shebna is neither a son, and because he's not a son, he can never be a father. And he, his, the authority that's being removed from Shebna and given to Eliakim is the authority to be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He will open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And this picture of the key of David, the key speaks of the prime minister having all the authority to act in the name of the king for the service of God and the well-being of God's people. Not, not for your own well-being. And we see always, this is always the, the issue with power. Power in God's kingdom is to be used to serve God's people, not to serve one's self. And so this picture that we see in the book of Revelation that Jesus being the holy and the true one, and by the way, the fact that he calls himself the holy one, the main name for the Lord in Isaiah is what? The holy one of Israel. The one who exercises the authority to bind and to loose, to provide access or to restrict access to God's kingdom. That is the Holy One of Israel. And that's who Jesus is to the church in Philadelphia. Jesus has the keys. But see, the whole point of this passage is the keys are being transferred. There's a transfer of authority here from one who was given the authority and abused the power of that authority by using it for himself. And it's being transferred to somebody else who will use that key, that power, for, for God's purposes and God's people. Do we understand that this is behind Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his disciples in Matthew 16? In Matthew 16, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he says the same thing, in essence, to the church in Philadelphia. I'm giving you keys that have not been utilized by others who declare themselves to be my people to exercise my authority. So the church in Philadelphia, the message behind this, it's all about 
It's all about a transfer of authority from those who call themselves the people of God but use that authority illegitimately to those who, like the church in Philadelphia, have been tested and found worthy and will be given the keys. This is very important. This is very significant. Verse 23 continues, And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place. This fastening like a peg in a secure place. The Hebrew word for secure is in a place of faithfulness, a place of trustworthiness, a true place, an authentic place. So Jesus says he's not only the holy one, but he's the true one. He's the one who renders an authentic use of God's power in God's kingdom versus an inauthentic. And I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. Instead of a throne of self-seeking, it's a throne of glory. May I just jump ahead and make an application to what it means to be in the church in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia church is not seeking its own glory. The Philadelphia church is seeking the glory of the Father's house, is seeking the glory of the Lord, not seeking to promote its own agenda, its own desires, its own destiny, but the purposes of the Lord, the glory of the Lord. He will become a throne of honor to his Father's house, and they will hang on him the whole honor of his Father's house, the offspring and issue, every small vessel from the cups to all the flagons. And if, you, if your translation reads something different, it's because you, you, you're dealing with different kinds of Hebrew terms. But the whole, the whole point is there, he's a peg. Just like a, a peg, a tent peg, or a peg on the wall that's going to hold things, speaks of something established, something firm, something permanent. Eliakim becomes something stable in the house of God that the Lord can hang the vessels of ministry upon that steward because he is in a secure place. He is faithful to the Lord, so he will be faithful for the Lord's purposes. And then an interesting verse, in that day declares the Lord of hosts, and see it's the Lord of hosts again, the peg that was fastened in a secure place will give way and it will be cut down and fall and the load that was on it will be cut off for the Lord has spoken. What is that verse saying? Now, it just got done with a disclaimer to Shebna and an exaltation to Eliakim and here one interpretation can be that even Eliakim will ultimately fail. Now, if, if we look at it that way, and that is one, one potential way to take it, if we look at it that way, it's saying, but nonetheless, the real secure peg in the house of David for God's people is not going to be any man, not a bad man like Shebna or a good man like Eliakim. It's going to be reserved for well, the one to whom it's given in the book of Revelation. I'm the holy one. I'm the true one. I have the keys of David. I have the keys of death and hell. And in that case, it's a, it's a, 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 a great, powerful prophecy that looks to Jesus. That ultimately, the one who will ultimately fulfill this secure place can only be Jesus. Now, this idea of the key of David being placed on the shoulder. Keep your hand in uh, Isaiah 23 and just go back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9 brings a fourth figure into the book of Isaiah. We know we have the, the, the scion of David, the son of David in Isaiah 11. We have the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 40 through 55, and we have the anointed Messiah in 
Isaiah 62. But here we have Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, of him it is said in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. See, the key of David is on the shoulder. It means this, this authority to exercise God's kingdom prerogatives that come forth to the son of David will be on the shoulder of Emmanuel. Emmanuel is prophesied a, a few chapters before this in Isaiah, and this is again all one single context moving through, and Emmanuel means God with us. And God with us is the one, the government will be upon his shoulder. He'll have the real key of David to bind in the loose. Government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Ruler of Peace. He is going to be this surprisingly awesome, wonderful figure who brings the counsel of the Lord, the wisdom of the Lord, who brings the very might and power of God, divine might and power, and he is an, a father. Ultimately, he's a son, but he's a son who becomes a father. He's the father of eternity. He brings eternal life, and he is the ruler of shalom. This is what the divine rule looks like. Of the increase of his government and of shalom, of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness. There it is. We've been seeing it all along. Justice and righteousness together. From this time forth and forevermore. And who's going to accomplish this? The zeal of the Lord of hosts. Just like in Isaiah 22. The Lord of armies is going to accomplish this. Not human political means. Not empires or human rulers or human leaders, godly or ungodly, but the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Back to Isaiah 22, and, then, and we'll, we'll conclude uh, the argument. And then we'll head back to Revelation chapter 3. I wanted to see, there, there, are, there are a number of things that Feck has said, but, but I, I, I wanted to um, really just point out, I, just, I wanted to point out just one thing in particular uh, that, that Feck has says here. And of course, since it's a sin to underline anything in one of my books, I, I have to find it here. You can't, you can't write in a book. It just, it, it just it, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't, it, it's not a book anymore if you, if you write in it. There is a, there's an interesting connection because remember the, the, the Greek Old Testament, the, this passage that was in Hebrew and Isaiah was translated into Greek. And in the, the verse that talks about um, verse 23, that I will fasten Eliakim like a peg in a secure place. Um, the, the relationship between the word peg, which is a Hebrew term, and a Greek term that corresponds to it is that peg in Hebrew has a relationship and correspondence to pillar in the Greek. Peg and pillar, they're, they're both considered something that is secure. Uh, in fact, some of the, the, the Greek translations uh, of this says that, um, that Eliakim would be established as a pillar, would be established as a pillar as opposed to being established as a peg. So I wanted that, I wanted you to have that in the back of your mind as we head back to Revelation 3. Let's, let's go to Revelation 3. So 
So Jesus says, these things says the Holy One, the True One, He who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Now, Jesus is now going to have the key, and he's going to confer that key, that authority to the church in Philadelphia. Verse 8 says, I know your works. Behold, I have granted you an open door. See, I'm going to use that key to open a door. I've granted you a door, an open door, which no one is able to shut it because you have little strength, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. The reason that Philadelphia looks like Eliakim and is being given authority that it doesn't have is because it has kept the word of the Lord. It's guarded his word. It's valued his word. It's protected his word. It's lived up to his word. And, and they have not denied his name. His name is his essential character. The Lord says, you have been faithful not to compromise my word and not to compromise my name. So I am going to grant you this these keys to open doors. Now, now we, we, we need a, a few examples of the opening of doors in the New Testament. Go back with me, first of all, to Acts chapter 5. Acts 5 is one of those the disciples go to jail passages. You know, the disciples are jailed in Acts 5 because they were just stirring things up among the people. Peter goes to jail in Acts 12, and he's going to be executed by Herod. Paul and Silas find themselves in the jail in, in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And the one thing that always happens is the Lord gets them out of jail. Miraculously, they get out of jail. And that's an important important thing to understand. Here's an occurrence of, and I'm looking for an occurrence where open door will be seen in the New Testament. In Acts 5.17 it says, the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Why? Because in the previous verse, the disciples are healing the sick and casting out devils, and they're they're saying, this is making our society unstable. And they laid hands on the apostles. The apostles lay hands on people to get sick. They lay hands on them to put them in jail. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. Doors are open. I open a door before you. Philadelphia is coming out of jail. Philadelphia is coming out of prison. And we're going to see what that jail and that prison is like. But let me say this much. It's the prison and jail of the very prophetic destiny that they have known was theirs for years, not coming to pass. What does a church do when it knows that it has a prophetic destiny and that destiny hasn't come to pass? Well, we wait for the Lord to unlock the door of the jail to come out. The next occurrence is in 1 Corinthians 16. The next three occurrences, Paul uses the exact terminology, an open door, just as Jesus uses with Philadelphia in Revelation 3. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he's writing from Ephesus, and he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. He's saying, I'm staying in Ephesus because the Lord has opened a door for me to function apostolically in Ephesus. It's interesting, he says, and, and we have to understand this, wherever there's an open door, 
there will also be many adversaries. The devil is as attracted to God opening doors as the angels are. The devil is as attracted to an open door as God's Holy Spirit is attracted to an open door. We need to understand this kind of new covenant dualism is as the Holy Spirit moves more and more powerfully, adversarial warfare increases. But Paul says there's an open door. And see, this is how Paul is led by the Lord. When a door is open, he walks through it. If we go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, just a couple verses over. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Paul says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, a door was opened to me by the Lord. It's for the sake of the gospel that doors are open. The Lord is transferring to Philadelphia. He's getting them out of prison. He's giving them victory over their warfare, and he is opening a door that the gospel might go forth. And we'll, we'll see that uh, momentarily when we go back to Revelation 3, what that entails. Finally, Colossians chapter 4. See, it's funny. The Lord would always get his disciples out of jail supernaturally. Paul is writing Colossians from jail. He never gets out of that jail. And so the, the, uh, apparently the idea is, is if the Lord wants you out of jail, he's going to get you out of jail. If he doesn't get you out of jail, then he's saying my purposes are going to be better fulfilled with your being in jail than your being out of it. And, of course, Paul brought the gospel to Rome when he was in jail. He always wanted to go to Rome, and he never got to Rome except in chains. He made it to Rome in chains. The Romans brought him there and imprisoned him. Sometimes chains accomplish the very purpose for which we've cried out to the Lord. So sometimes he lets us out of prison. Other times he puts us back in prison. He opens and no one shuts. He shuts and no one opens. Paul says in verse 2 of Colossians 4, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. See, prayer always has to be tied in with thanksgiving to be truly incense bowl tipping intercession. It's prayer and thanksgiving. It's worship and prayer together. He says, meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. I'm in prison, but that doesn't matter. I don't want the word to be in prison. And the word is that he would speak the mystery of Christ. And what is the mystery of Christ? The unveiling of Jesus. It's a new revelation of Jesus, a level of revelation of Jesus that hasn't been seen. And let's go back to Revelation 3. But before you get to Revelation, well, actually, go a little bit past the church in Philadelphia to Revelation 4. After, remember, Revelation 1, John sees Jesus. Revelation 2 and 3, he declares a word to the churches. And look what happens in Revelation 4. After these things, verse 1, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. John is called up to go to heaven because of an open door. The Lord will take us to heaven and it's important that we be taken to heaven to be able to minister things from a heavenly perspective. All right, let's, let's finish up on uh, Revelation 3. I know your works, verse 8. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. I'm now giving you a key. See, the, the open door means God gives us the key to have greater levels of authority in the body of Christ. And what are the greater levels of authority? Well, first of all, the, the qualification for that is you have little strength. Now, I've taught this before. 
you have little strength can mean exactly what it says. You just don't have that spiritual strength you need. It can also mean that you don't have a lot of money. It can also mean that you don't have a lot of political influence. The truth is probably all three of those were correct concerning Philadelphia. Not a lot of spiritual strength, not a lot of money. In other words, can't make an economic impact and no political impact whatsoever because Philadelphia looks and says Republicans Democrats my gosh is there any is there is there any other party and Jesus says yes it's the party of the one who has the key of David Amen. upon his shoulder who opens and no one closes but even in the midst of all of that lack of what we would call human capital they have been faithful to the name of the Lord. They have kept his word. They've not denied his character. They, the church in Philadelphia has never compromised. And then this is what the Lord says. Here's the door I'm opening. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, indeed, I will make them come and to lay prostate before your feet to know that I have loved you. The chief issue that Philadelphia has had to face is the slander that comes from others who claim to be of God, others who claim to have the word of the Lord, and others who look at Philadelphia and slander them and say, and you don't have the word of the Lord. This is what Philadelphia's face, apparently. And of course, at this point in, in church history, there's, it's a, a, a Jewish-Christian kind of conflict. Certain Jews in, in a certain synagogue in Philadelphia are claiming to be the real people of God and saying that Philadelphia is a fault false manifestation of the people. God. They're being slandered. They're being said all kinds of negative things about them because they don't have this or they don't see this or they don't do this the way we do it. In modern terms, the synagogue of Satan would not represent Jewish versus Christian. It would represent Christian versus Christian because this is where we are today. And everybody is out there saying, look at us, we have it, we're somebody, but what they're doing is they're simply carving out their tomb in the place of royalty and exchanging the glory of the real king, Jesus, for their own glory. And we need to understand that the synagogue of Satan, when they speak these things, they speak things from a very powerful, very hostile, very abusive perspective. When we as the people of God who are simply attempting to be faithful to the Lord's message are being abused by our brothers and sisters in Christ, what kind of day have we come to? Well, not much different from what was experienced in the first century not much different from what was taking place in the 15th and the 16th century and the 19th century and the 20th century. It's just, it's all the same. There is this antagonism. Let me see, I, I'm, we're, we're gonna close, but let me, um, let me just see if I can quote something from Fecus, he's got, he's got some, some good things to say about this. He says, Christ's words of encouragement to the struggling but faithful church in Philadelphia shift in focus from the privileged status that they have received from the Lord who has opened a door for them to the future recognition of that status by the church in Philadelphia's enemies. Again, the authority of the message is heightened by means of a prophetic testimony from Isaiah. We're going to look at a couple verses in Isaiah and we'll close. 
Not only does the conflict between the church and the local synagogue involve disputes about spiritual legitimacy, possession of divine favor, but was no doubt aggravated by the political sanction enjoyed by Judaism in contrast to the social and political discrimination endured by the Christian community. In the first century, Judaism had political status with Rome. The Christians did not. Why does this issue of political status find its way into the Old Testament and Isaiah, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, in the New Testament, in the gospel of Jesus, who is crucified by a, a joint decree of the political powers and the religious powers acting together. Why, why is it constantly repeating itself with the disciples going to jail, being jailed politically? Because beware of the of the desire of politics to have the final say over the Lord. To emphasize that the present disadvantage, disadvantage is only temporary, John takes up an image employed by 2nd and 3rd Isaiah to illustrate the future reversal of the circumstances of the faithful, of the faithful remnant of the church in Philadelphia as opposed to the oppression that comes from the synagogue of Satan. Let's close in Isaiah. Keep in mind what the Lord has said. I'll, I'll read it to you, but let's go to, we actually we have quotes from 2nd and 3rd Isaiah. Go with me to Isaiah 45, first of all, and these are passages we've read in our study. Remember, Isaiah 40 through 66 talks about the children of Israel coming out of exile and being returned to the land. 45.14 says this. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt, the merchandise of Cush, and the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over to you, he's speaking to his people, and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. That's a passage that's being alluded to. Notice the, the, the Gentiles, the nations, will bow down to the Israelites and declare that God is surely in your midst. 49. 49.23 says, Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I am the one who makes things happen. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. The first thing that's going to be said, God is truly in your midst. That's what they, your enemies, will say to you, church in Philadelphia. The second is, you, Philadelphia, will know that I am the Lord. You'll know who I am. You will know that I'm the God who makes things happen and that those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Philadelphia, you will fulfill the purpose for which I've raised you up. And then Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 14. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you. Notice always this, this, they are going to prostrate themselves. Prostrate themselves. Okay, before you. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despise you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord 
the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. They will know that God is with you. You will know that I am the Lord, and they will call you legitimate. Those who abused you, those who persecuted you, those who said false, lying, slanderous things about you will declare that you are Zion, the city of the Lord. And then one more place, Isaiah 43. And this we need to read um, the whole, about seven verses, for one small portion. Isaiah 43, 1. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. There's our Isaiah song that Allison and Catherine were singing today. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I'm the Holy One. I'm the true one, Jesus says. Your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you, is what the Lord speaks to the church in Philadelphia. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Notice this constant, fear not, I'm with you. That's Emmanuel, the one upon whose shoulder the government rests, the wonderful in counsel, mighty God, eternal Father, ruler of peace, ruler of shalom. Fear not, I am with you, Emmanuel, God with us. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. We've sung that for years at the church here. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, And so the Lord says, indeed, I will, and it actually says, it's, it's interesting because verse 8 says, I will give you an open door. And verse 9 says, I will give those of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they are Jews and are not but are lying. Behold, I will make them so that they shall come and shall do obeisance before your feet and they shall know that I have loved you. But I will give them to you. And there is an implication that the very enemies will be given to the church in Philadelphia as a gift for the conversion of those enemies. See, that's, remember the whole thing of Isaiah 40 through 66. It's not just the Lord is going to restore Israel, but he's going to bring the nations along with Israel. And even these passages, kings shall be your foster fathers, queens your nursing mothers. I'll, I'll give you the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush, Cush and all the Sab Sabaeans. The sons of those who oppressed you shall come bending low to you. God is bringing the very ones that have slandered to that church as a gift, as a gift of their faithfulness to the Lord, as a gift of their faithfulness of the Lord, to the Lord. And that's why verse 10 says in Revelation 3, because you've kept my command to persevere. See, that's what Philadelphia did. It persevered. And how do we persevere? We persevere by keeping the word and not denying his name. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. See, this transfer of authority to, to Philadelphia is that you are going to become a storehouse church. You're going to become a place of protection. You're going to become a place where, where Others are falling and others are failing and others are being consumed by this reckoning and this test. You're going to be a place of preservation. 
because you have persevered, you will now be able to preserve. And the final verse, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And remember the relationship between the word peg and the word pillar. It's interesting, I'll close with this statement. Judaism said the three pegs for the house of Israel were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fathers, the fathers were the three pegs, and they were making an allusion to Isaiah 22 where Eliakim is pictured as this peg upon which the Lord is going to hang all the utensils of his house on those secure pegs. But remember, there's a relationship to peg in the Hebrew and pillar in the Greek. So when he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. The church in Philadelphia has this destiny to be a pillar. Remember when Paul saw Peter, James, and John in Galatians 2, what did he call them? The pillars of the church. He was saying they're like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the pegs. Peter, James, and John are the pillars. And Philadelphia is being called a pillar. The, the, the pillar of leadership upon which the Lord can fasten the vessels and the purposes of his kingdom on a faithful church. So Lord, we ask that, Father, we, we, we desire to understand, Lord. We desire to understand what you meant when you said that being the church in Philadelphia was part of our prophetic destiny, Lord. I remember this was brought up just recently to Apostle Reggie Halliday, and he said, we, we have that same word for our church in Bethany Fellowship, that we would be the church in Philadelphia. Lord. Father, what we're saying is there needs to be churches in Philadelphia in this hour, churches that are not in the left and churches that are not in the right and churches that are not in this experience or that experience or this self-aggrandizement or that self-aggrandizement this notoriety or that notoriety we need to be a church in philadelphia philadelphia has little strength but it has persevered and in doing so it's demonstrated the right to receive the apostolic keys of the kingdom. So we pray, Lord, those apostolic keys are not for Philadelphia. Eliakim was not given the key for Eliakim the same way Shebna got the key for Shebna. Eliakim got the key to bring glory to his father's house. Glory to his father's house. And we desire, Lord, we desire, Lord, to have the glory for the Father's house, brought to churches in Philadelphia in this hour who will be raised up not just for themselves but for the entire body of Christ. Lord, we live in an hour where abuse of power and authority pervades every level of society. Political abuse, economic abuse, social abuse, racial abuse, abuse in the house of God. Lord, we see parents abusing their children, spouses abusing each other. We see abuse everywhere, and that is the spirit of the synagogue of Satan. It's an abuse that's done from the standpoint of we're the chosen ones, and what we say goes. What I think, what I feel, what I desire, that's what goes. That spirit needs to be broken, Lord. The synagogue of Satan needs to be broken, and the church in Philadelphia needs to replace the synagogue of Satan. Grant it to us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.